Cognitive psychology, that's the, that's the name of the class. I think it maybe it's just cognitive psychology, psych 365. Uh, I am not a cognitive psychologist. The person that put this class together, or at least suggested that we should give this class, uh, was a cognitive psychologist. And I'm sure that they would have done a much better job uh, than I am, uh, than I will do. And that's unfortunate, but... Um, I will do the best job that I possibly can. Uh, I have taught this class before. Uh, cognitive psychologists have a select uh, way of looking at the world. Um, and it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I'm not going to argue that, that it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, I will try to keep my own, <laughs> my own negative ideas about, uh, about the, uh, the discipline uh, out of the class. Uh, this is probably the last time I hopefully, hopefully this is the last time I'll talk about that. But uh, uh, cognitive psychology has to do with uh, research. Um, most psychologists are members of the APA. Uh, the, uh, the cognitive psychologists are members of another of another organization. Uh, APS, I think. APS. Cognitive psychology. They, um, APA has a lot of journals, and APS has a lot of journals as well. APS, Cognitive Psychology, APS. Uh, I should have looked this up before the thing started. Association of Psychological Science. Uh, so, so Cognitive Psychologists are a member of the uh, Association for Psychological Science. Um, their journals are a little bit different. They're very research oriented. Uh, any research is good research as far as they're concerned. Um, I have a problem with that and, and uh, like I said, this, I'll try, this will be the last time I, I talk about that. They think that any, any research is good research and some research is, is not. I, some research should never have been started. But you know, we won't, let's, let's not uh, quibble about that. Let's go ahead and, uh, and get started with the recording. Oh, we're already recording. <laughs> okay. I hope I didn't mess anything up. Okay, here we go. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'll try to be as positive as I, poss I, as I possibly can. Cognitive psychology has been defined as the psychology of mental processes, or more specifically, the way in which the brain processes information. Cognition includes the way we uh, take in information from the outside world, how we make sense of that information, and what use we make of it. Cognition thus involves various different kinds of information processing, which occur at different stages. Information taken in by the sense organs does, uh, goes through an initial stage of perception, which involves an analysis of its content. Even at this early stage of processing, the brain is already extracting meaning from the input in an effort to make sense uh, of the information it contains. The process of perception will often lead to uh, the making of some kind of record of the input received, and this involves learning and memory storage. Once a memory has been created for some item of, of information, it can be stored for later use to, to assist the individual in some other setting or task. Memory can be stored for, for later use to assist the uh, individual in some other setting or task. This will normally require the retrieval of the information. Retrieval is sometimes carried out for its own sake, merely to access some information stored in the past. We sometimes retrieve information uh, to help us to perform further mental activities such as thinking. Thought processes often make use of memory retrieval. However, thinking usually involves more than just the retrieval of old memories, as we often need to rearrange and manipulate stored information to make it fit in with a new problem or task. The cognitive processes are, in reality, more complex and interactive than this simple explanation. There is no exact point at which perception ceases and memory storage begins because the process of perception 
in itself actually creates the memory trace. So in a sense, these processes are continuous. All of the stages of cognition overlap and interact with one another. It would be more realistic to think of cognition as a continuous flow of information from the input stage through the output stage, undergoing different forms of processing along the way, a continuous flow of information going in and going out. Exper experimental cognitive psychology involves carrying out scientific experiments on human participants to investigate the ways in which they perceive, learn, remember, or Think. And of course, she is experimenting on a rat. The use of computer modeling or of cognitive processes is an approach that involves the simulation of certain aspects of human cognitive function by writing computer programs in order to test out the feasibility of a possible mechanism of brain function. Cognitive neuropsychology involves the study of individuals who have suffered some form of brain injury. We can discover a great deal about the working of the normal brain by studying the types of cognitive impairment which results from lesions, uh, for example, damage uh, in certain regions of the brain. Brain damage can impair information processing by disrupting one or more stages of cognition, or in some cases, by breaking the links between different stages. Cognitive neuroscience involves the use of techniques such as brain imaging, i.e. brain scans, to investigate the neural activities that underlie cognitive processing. The two most widely used brain imaging techniques are PET scans, positron emission tomography, and MRI scans, magnetic resonance imaging. PET scans involve the detection of positrons emitted by radioactive chemicals injected into the bloodstream, whereas MRI scans detect responses to a powerful magnetic field. Both techniques uh, can provide accurate images of brain structures, but MRI is better at detecting changes over a period of time, as for example in measuring the brain's response to a stimulus of some kind. The scientific study of psychology began towards the end of the 19th century. Wilhelm Wundt set up a, a first, uh, the first psychology laboratory at Leipzig in Germany where he carried out uh, research on perception, including some of the earliest studies of visual illusions. Leipzig, Germany is uh, fairly close to Berlin. Uh, it was in the eastern part of uh, East Germany when, uh, uh, after World War II, they separated the two Germanys. There was East Germany that was controlled by the uh, Soviet Union, and then West Germany was, uh, became a uh, free area. Uh, I was actually stationed there uh, when I was in the Air Force, uh, but I never went to Leipzig. That was uh, out, of, uh, out of bounds. We could go to Berlin, but we couldn't go anywhere else. Actually, we couldn't really travel in East Germany at all, except for Berlin. It was a, an open city, as it were. Uh, and if you wanted to go into East Berlin, you could, you could go into East Berlin from West Berlin, uh, but you had to go through uh, a single checkpoint, and that checkpoint was called Checkpoint Charlie, uh, and uh, I visited Berlin twice playing softball uh, for my, uh, my base team, uh, so I visited East Germany twice. One time I drove the Autobahn from, uh, East to West, or from Berlin to, uh, to West Germany, and I had to cross all of these checkpoints in order to get to uh, Berlin. They didn't just let you drive on the Autobahn. They, they made you stop about every, I don't know, 15 or 20 miles or so. And it was about uh, 75, 80 miles, I guess, from, uh, from West Germany to uh, uh, West Berlin. Interesting, interesting trip. Uh, the second time we, or the first time we went to Berlin, we went through our, we went on the troop train. Uh, so there, you can, you can either travel the Autobahn and get checked every 15 miles or so, <laughs> or you, if you were in the military, you can, you can take the troop train. So they have a train that they allow to go through, but you're not allowed to open your windows. They don't want you to see what, what's in the train stations or anything. You're not allowed to get out of the train. Really kind of interesting. Of course, this is back in the in 79 and 8, uh, 
8081. So it's a long time ago. Nothing to worry about at this point. In 1885, Hermann uh, Ebbinghaus uh, published the first experimental research on memory, and many subsequent uh, researchers were to adopt his methods over the years that followed. Perhaps the most lasting work of this early period was a remarkable book written by William James in 1890 entitled Principles of Psychology. Uh, it uh, in that book, uh, James proposed a number of theories of cognition, which are still broadly accepted today, including, to give just one example, a theory distinguishing uh, between short-term and long-term memory. William James was a professor of uh, philosophy uh, at Harvard University. Cognitive psychology made slow progress in the early years due to the growing influence of behaviorism, an approach which constrained psychologists to the investigation of externally observable behavior. The behavior's position was clearly stated by Watson in 1913, who maintained that psychologists should consider only events that were observable, such as the stimulus presented and any consequent behavioral response to that stimulus. In other words, if you couldn't, if you couldn't see it and you couldn't uh, detect it in one form or another, if it wasn't detectable, then you couldn't uh, talk about it. That's the behaviorists. Watson argued that psychologists should not concern themselves with inner mental processes, such as conscious experience and thought, which could not be directly observed. The behaviorists were essentially trying to establish psychology as a true science, using the same approach as other sciences. Another uh, a notable example of the behaviorist approach is the classic uh, work carried out uh, on learning by B.F. Skinner in 1938. Uh, he trained rats to press a lever in order to obtain a food pellet as a reward or reinforcement. The work of Skinner and other behaviorists certainly generated a few uh, important findings, but they completely disregarded the cognitive processes underlying the responses uh, that they were studying. Proper understanding uh, of human cognition could only be achieved by investigating the mental process, uh, the mental processes which the behaviors were so determined to eliminate from their studies. The first of these pioneers were the Gestalt psychologists, who emphasized the way in which the components of perpetual uh, perceptual input become grouped and integrated into patterns and whole figures. It is very easy to demonstrate the importance of inner mental processes in human cognition. Now, the interesting thing about this is that the behaviorists were all from the United States. Watson and Skinner are, 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 are from the United States. Now, what we had before, we only had one person from the United States. Irving, uh, Ebbinghaus is German, and so is uh, Wundt, of course. They're, they're both German. Uh, so we've got the the uh, American school, which is pushing. Uh, if you can't see it, then you can't study it. And then you've got you have the European uh, model, uh, which says that uh, that we need to look at the entire process. And the Gestaltists, the three Gestaltists, um, Wertheimer, Kafka, and uh, I can't think of the third guy's name. Anyway, and we're going to see them in just a second. These guys were all German, and uh, they started uh, doing research during World War I, but uh, after World War I, they started publishing their results. Uh, so the Gestaltists uh, were German. We're all, uh, we're three Germans. The first, uh, the, uh, yeah, we already talked about this. Okay. The idea that we contribute something to our perceptual uh, input from our previous uh, knowledge, uh, Kuhler, that's the other guy's name. The, guy, the other guy's name is Kuhler. Kuhler, Kafka, and Wertheimer are the three uh, Gestaltists. The idea that we contribute something to our perceptual input from our previous knowledge and experience was proposed by the Gestalt group. Uh, Gestalt is German for shape or form. They suggested that we add something to what we perceive so that the perception of a whole object will be something more than just the sum of its uh, component parts. And that is the meaning or the idea behind Gestalt. The Gestaltists argued that the perception of a figure uh, depended on its meaningful content, which uh, favored the selection 
of the simplest and best interpretation available. These Gestalt theories uh, were uh, perhaps rather vague, but they did at least make an attempt to explain how we make sense of complex figures such as faces. And uh, in this picture, you can either, either see a face of an old man with a beard, he's got a bald head, there's his fingers, he's got on his chest, uh, there's epilepsy on his shoulder, uh, or you can see uh, an old man standing here and a lady standing there with her baby, and this is a dog laying down, and they're standing in a, an entrance way. You can see it either way, uh, and sometimes if you see it, you can't unsee it. There's a picture of the face, there's another face over here. Anyway, lots of different things in this picture. Uh, the schema theory proposed by Bartlett in 1932 was another early attempt to provide an explanation for the way that we make sense of our perceptual input. The schema theory proposes that all new perceptual input is analyzed by comparing it with items which are already in our memory store, such as shapes and sounds which are familiar with, uh, from past experiences. These stored items are referred to as schemas, and they include a huge variety of sensory patterns and concepts. A uh, good uh, way to think of a schema, if you go into a McDonald's uh, restaurant in, uh, in Albuquerque, it, will be the same as going into a, a McDonald's restaurant in Phoenix. Uh, the the uh, makeup of, of the building is, is almost exactly the same. And that's what a schema is. So when you go to, uh, uh, go to, uh, uh, or can we go in and out Burger? Uh, there's only an in and out in Phoenix. Anyway, if you go into a restaurant, the schemas are the, uh, this is a, uh, drive through restaurant. This is a uh, this is a restaurant where you can sit down, but most people just grab their food and, and, and go away. Uh, you have to go up to the counter and order your food. Then they will give you your food, and you can either go sit down or you can uh, take it outside and, and eat outside, whatever. Anyway, that's a schema for a uh, for a uh, fast food restaurant. Trying to think of the one in Gallup that I used to go to. <laughs> Every time I was there, I thought their hamburgers were really good. I can't think of the place. The schema theory uh, has some interesting implications because it suggests that their uh, perception and memory of an input may sometimes be changed and distorted to fit our existing schemas. Since our schemas are partly acquired from our personal experience, it follows that our perception and memory of any given stimulus will be unique in each individual person. Unique to each individual person. Different people will therefore perceive the same input in different ways, depending on their own unique store of experiences. Schema and Gestalt theory had a major influence on, on the development of cognitive psychology by emphasizing the role played by inner mental processes and stored knowledge rather than considering only stimulus and response. However, many years would pass before this viewpoint would take over from behaviorism as a mainstream approach to cognition. Nicer in 1967 identified two main uh, types of input processing known as top-down and bottom-up processing. Top-down processing involves generation of schemas uh, by higher cortical structures and these schemas are sent down the nervous system for comparison with the incoming stimulus. Top-down processing is also sometimes referred to as schema-driven or conceptually-driven process. So if somebody that's an expert and they go into a situation and they look at that situation and they say, from my experience, I have all this experience, I'm looking at what's happening in this, in this room and I can see that this is what is, is, should be happening now. I can tell you what needs to happen now. Let's say you're a detective and you come into a, a situation where there's a hostage situation. Uh, since you, you are an expert, you uh, have seen many uh, hostage situations. This is the way you need to talk to the, uh, the individual that's taken the hostages. This is what you need to do. 
you need to not aggravate the, the individual. You need to bring them, uh, if they're uh, highly agitated, you need to keep that from uh, agitating them more. And, there, and therefore, that is the way that you handle the situation. You are the expert. You have the knowledge. That's the top. And you are t taking this situation and you are putting your knowledge, you are allowing your knowledge to dictate what's going to happen next. That's top-down processing. If you look at this picture, you can either see a rat with a long tail, or you can see a man's face, and these are his glasses. His mouseketeer ears are his glasses. There's his nose, there's his mouth, and there's his ear. So you can see this, this is all gestalt, how you perceive things. Bottom-up processing is initiated by stimulation at the bottom end of the nervous system, the sense organs, which then progresses up towards the higher cortical areas. Bottom-up processing is known as stimulus-driven or data-driven processing because it is the, in the incoming stimulus which triggers an appropriate form of processing. The other day, a bird flew past us and started singing. And I was trying to, to identify the bird. Um, it was yellow. Um, now I can't think of what the bird's name is. Anyway, it was yellow. So um, I, I had to think about what, how many yellow birds have I seen? Well, I can't, I, it's, it's a wild bird, so it's not a parakeet. Uh, it must be something else. Uh, it's a golden, uh, never mind. I can't think of it anyway. Anyway, so the idea, that's bottom uh, up processing. You get the stimulus and then you identify it. My, my wife does this with uh, with plants. We have lots of weeds in our in our yard and she'll come across something and she'll say, I don't know what that is. She'll ask me what it is. And this happened the other day. Uh, she was looking, I, I keep identifying this one tree as a elm tree and uh, it turns out that it's a hackberry. It's a hackberry tree, which has a very similar uh, leaf to, a, uh, to an elm tree. So we got this giant hackberry in the back that's it's spreading its its seeds all over the place. Anyway, if it was an elm, that's okay. But if since it's a hackberry, we're not exactly sure what we're going to do with it. Anyway, that's bottom up processing. You get the stimulus, and then you identify. Uh, then you have higher order thinking as to what's going to happen next. Um, you see a plant. You say, "Is that a flower? Is that a weed?" Uh, you need to identify it. Once you identify it, you can decide whether you want to cut it out or let it live by what it is. Usually my wife likes to uh, uh, support the bees and the, the bees, the pollinators, so she likes plants that have flowers that they, uh, that they can utilize. A major shift towards the cognitive process uh, approach uh, began in the 1950s when the introduction of the electronic computer provided a new source of inspiration for cognitive psychologists. Now this is this is the part that really kind of irritates me. Uh, I'm, this is the last time I'm going to talk about how this uh, I don't agree with this. But uh, as far as computers are concerned, they tried to make computers like brains. Then they started comparing brains with computers. Uh, anyway, it, it just seemed like the uh, human brain, the process processes of the human brain. Uh, you, can, you can use the same words that you use for computer, but it seems kind of silly to me because the, the brain came out much earlier than the, than the computer did. So why in the world are you identifying the functions of the brain uh, using terms of uh, the computer? Anyway, I'm not going to talk about this anymore. This is, this is the way cognitive psychology uh, computer systems uh, can be designed which are able to carry out cognitive processes uh, similar to perception and memory storage, and these computerized information processing devices provided some possible explanation for the processing mechanisms within the human brain. Furthermore, computers could be used as a test bed for trying out possible human cognitive functions, providing a means of modeling and testing the feasibility of a particular processing mechanism. By separating out the various component stages of the cognitive process, it is possible to devise a sequential flowchart which can be written as a, as a computer program 
and actually put the test uh, to the test to see whether it can process information as the brain would. Of course, such experiments cannot prove that the programs and mechanisms operating within the computer are the same as the mechanisms which occur in the brain, but they can at least establish whether a particular processing system is workable. Hubble and Weissel in 1959 from Johns Hopkins found simple feature detector cells when carrying out uh, microelectrode recordings in the brain of a cat. Uh, the next year, Selfridge and Neiser in 1960 demonstrated that a computer using a hierarchy of electronic feature uh, detectors uh, proceeding through many stages of increasing complexity could be made to identify complex shapes and patterns. And of course, now computers do that on a fairly regular basis. The finding that a computer can perform pattern recognition by using systems of feature detectors suggests a possible mechanism for the identification of shapes and patterns in the human brain. Indeed, such feature uh, detectors have been discovered in the brain. Haynes and Reese in two, uh, 2005 have used functional imaging techniques to identify similar feature detectors, uh, detector cells in the human brain. This is a picture of the Taj Mahal in India. Accra, I think. A-C-R-A -A is the name of the town, or the city where it is. This is what the Taj Mahal looks like. As you're using your um, feature detectors, uh, these are the things that you are noticing. These are the features that you are noticing. As weird as that may seem. Broadbent, 1958, carried out experiments on divided attention, which showed that people have difficulty in attending to two separate inputs at the same time. Broadbent explained his findings in terms of the sequence of processing stages, which could be represented as a series of boxes in a flowchart. Certain crucial stages were identified, which seemed to act as a bottleneck to information flow because of their limited processing capacity. In other words, you can only process so much information. If you have two pieces of information coming in at the same time, you have to ignore one piece of information and uh, pay attention to the other. That is the bottleneck. The problem is you can only uh, think of one thing at a time. This is one of the reasons why you should never drive and text. Because if you're texting, you're thinking about what's going on uh, with your text. Uh, you're trying to print with your thumbs while at the same time you're driving down the road. And of course, you're not paying attention to, to traffic. If an emergency happens, then, then you're SOL. Uh, so that's, that's, that's a real problem. Uh, interestingly, uh, when uh, cars first started getting having radios put in, uh, they argued this very same thing. If people are listening to the radio, then they're not going to pay attention to their driving. That's what they said. Uh, of course, you know, people have uh, discovered a way of listening to the music uh, unless they're un unless they're really thinking about uh, uh, what's going on on the road. Uh, driving isn't that difficult uh, now. Uh, in the old days, of course, cars were a lot more complex. Uh, when I was first born, when I was young in the 1950s, uh, almost all cars were automatic or were uh, manual transmission. Uh, they were sticks, uh, so you had to, to uh, uh, shift gears a lot, uh, shift gears whenever you slowed down. They didn't go as fast as they do today. Uh, there were, if you've ever driven a stick, most of the uh, manual transmissions were uh, three speeds. They, uh, they only had, the transmission only had three speeds. Uh, the car I drive now is a stick, and, and it's got six, it's a uh, six speed. So in order for me to get up to speed, I have to shift the gears six times. <laughs> First, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, of course. Uh, and of course, I've been driving for, what, uh, 55 years? 56 years. Um, so I started out on a three speed, and then uh, if you had a ra racing transmission, it was a four speed. Uh, and then uh, back in the 70s or 80s, they invented five speeds. And now, of course, 
you get a, a, a manual transmission, it's probably a six-speed, as much fun as that is. But we're, we're getting as complex as uh, as a semi, uh, as a semi. They've got 18 gears or something. Why am I talking about this? Because you can only do one thing at a time. You can only think about one thing at a time. Can you think of steering and, and shifting gears? Really kind of interesting because when we were living in Japan, the Japanese drive on the uh, on the right side of the road, left side of the road. They, <laughs> they have to drive on the left. So the uh, driver is on the right side window. Okay, so you're steering with your right hand. And if you've got a manual transmission, you're shifting gears with your left hand. Really kind of interesting because uh, I can I can automatic, you know, I, I, I put my brain on automatic in order to shift gears, not, no big deal. Uh, but I'm shifting gears with my right hand and steering with my left. Um, when I had to uh, shift from steering with my right and shifting gears with my left, uh, it was, I had to think about it. I had to think about it because uh, the gears are in actually the same place. Uh, but uh, when, you, when it's your right hand, uh, first gear is closest to you. And when you're, it's your left hand, it's farthest away from you. So that was kind of interesting. Um, and, and I had to concentrate in order to, uh, to be able to drive a, uh, a Japanese car. It's really kind of fun. <laughs> this was an approach of information processing owed its inspiration to electronic telecommunications and community, computing technology. There is a clear similarity between the human brain faced with a large array of incoming information and a telephone exchange faced with a large number of incoming calls or alternatively, a computer whose input has exceeded its processing capacity. In each case, many inputs are competing with one another for limiting, uh, limited processing resources, and the inputs must be prioritized and selectively processed if any information overload is to be avoided. Broadbent uh, referred to this process as selective attention, and, this, and his theoretical model of the limited uh, capacity processor provided cognitive psychology with an important new concept, information overload. And as you can see, it's blowing this guy's brains out. Cognitive neuroscience is concerned with the relationship between brain function and cognition and normally makes use of brain imaging techniques. Cognitive neuropsychology is also concerned with investigating the brain mechanisms underlying cognition but mainly by studying individuals who have suffered brain damage. Both of these related approaches are now accepted as important to cognitive psychology. Cognitive neuroscience and neuropsychology are both approaches which deal with brain function, so it would be useful to consider a basic working map of the brain at this point. The outer shell of the brain is known as the cerebral cortex and it is responsible for most of our higher cognitive processes. The various lobes of the cortex are extensively interconnected so that a single cognitive process may involve many different cortical areas. However, the brain is uh, to some extent modular in that certain brain uh, areas do perform specific functions. We know this largely, largely from the study of brain lesions, since damage to a certain part of the brain can often cause quite specific impairments. In recent years, the introduction of brain scanning equipment has provided an additional source of knowledge to, to supplement the findings of brain lesion studies. This is really kind of interesting. I worked at, started working in medicine in the early 70s, and all of these things um, were developed uh, while I was working in medicine. Uh, the CAT scan, the PET, the PET scan, the MRI, all of these things were developed while I was working in medicine. Once upon a time, uh, when I first started in medicine, especially working for the military, we didn't have anything more sophisticated than an EEG. In other words, that's just a mapping of the, elect uh, the electrical impulses coming out of the brain. 
So the, the PET scan and the CAT scan, of course, they're uh, advanced ways of x-raying, of seeing organs. Uh, this, was a, this was huge. This was, this was uh, really advanced medicine, really advanced psychology, because we were able to actually see what was going on in the brain. It has been established that the left and right hemispheres of the brain have particular specializations. In the right-handed uh, people, the left hemisphere is normally dominant since the nerves from each side of the brain cross over to control the opposite side of the body. The left, he left hemisphere also tends to be particularly involved with speech and language. And this is the area right here that we're talking about. That is, uh, that's, and that's the closest to your ear. Speech and language. The right hemisphere is more concerned with the processing of nonverbal inputs, such as the perception of patterns of, or faces. These functions may re be reversed in left handed people, though most still have left hemisphere specialization for language. Let's go ahead and get rid of that. That was blinding. The front and rear halves of the brain have broadly different functions. The rearmost part of the brain, the parietal, temporal, and occipital nodes, tends to be mainly concerned with the processing of input, as, for example, the analysis of visual and auditory perception. In contrast, the front part of the brain, in fact, the area corresponding to the frontal lobes, is mainly concerned with processing of output, such as control of movement and speech. And this is the frontal lobe. The blue portion here is the, the frontal lobe, and the rest of that is... Uh, the occipital, the temporal, and the, uh, and the parietal lobe. Parietal lobe, occipital lobe, and temporal lobe. This brown thing down here is the cerebellum. That has to do, mostly it has to do with movement. So the blue part, portion is the frontal lobe, the red portion is the parietal lobe, the yellow portion is the occipital lobe, and the green portion is the temporal lobe. The frontal lobes include the motor region of the cortex, which controls movement. Damage to this area is likely to cause problems with the control of movement or possibly some uh, degree of paralysis. Right there. That's where you're moving. And the frontal lobes is Broca's area, which controls the production of speech, and it is normally located in the left hemisphere of the brain. It was Broca's, it was Broca in 1861 who first noted that damage to this re region caused an impairment of speech production. And there you go. And this is one of the reasons why, I mean, we're talking about the human brain. So if you have a blow to your head, one of the reasons that we talk to you and we, we hold fingers out in front of your face and we try to get you to respond to us is because we want to know if you can speak. We want to know if this broca's area has been damaged uh, we want to know if you can see. We want to know if the occipital lobe has been damaged. We want to know if you think. That's one of the reasons why we ask you who's the president of the United States or what day it is, uh, that we want to find out if there's damage to the frontal lobe. Um, and uh, uh, eyesight has to do with the fingers. Uh, we're talking to you the whole time. We want to know if there's any damage to the side of your head. Uh, actually, this, your skull uh, in your temporal lobe, in your temporal, temporal area, is, is relatively soft, so it's really easy to damage that portion of your, of your brain. Uh, and if you have, sometimes you can't understand speech, sometimes you can't say anything if the brocus area is damaged. Parts of the frontal lobe, uh, lobes are involved in central executive function, which controls conscious mental processes such as the making of decisions. Neuroimaging studies have shown that activation of the prefrontal cortex occurs during activities requiring intelligent reasoning. This is according to Jung and Heyer in 2007. And prefrontal activation is also linked with the selective retrieval of memory items. And this is according to Q et al. in 2008. And this is the frontal lobe right here, of course. Prietal lobe, occipital lobe, The occipital lobes at the back of the brain are mainly concerned with the processing of visual input. Damage to the occipital lobes may impair visual uh, perception, 
This is according to Weisskrantz et al. in 1974, and Gazaniga et al. in 2009. And there's a simple mode. Now, one of the things that happens uh, to your head, let's say that you uh, are playing football and somebody hits you in the, in the front of your head. Well, one of the things we want to know is if you can think. Is there damage to your frontal lobe? But the other thing is that your brain is actually suspended in fluid. So if you get hit in the front of your head, the back of your head uh, rebounds against the back of the skull and uh, to, to, uh, before uh, all the damage is done. So you get hit in the front, but there's also uh, damage to the back of the brain at the same time. And this is one of the reasons why we hold fingers up, we ask you questions, you've been hit in the front of the head, do you have any damage to the, uh, to the back of your head at the same time? It happens all the time. This is, this is, it just dribbles around in there like a basketball. As you can see, there's a lot of area. That area is not air, that area is, is fluid. Uh, so if uh, somebody gets struck in the head, oops, gets struck in the head, uh, then there is the, what we refer to as the rebound effect. The, the brain actually bounces around inside the head. Dribbles like a basketball, depending on how hard you hit. Of course, if you hit hard enough, it just breaks your skull. And frequently that means uh, a lot of damage. The parietal lobes are, are also partly concerned with perception. They contain the somatic sensory cortex, which receives tactile which receives tactile input from the skin as well as feedback from the muscles and internal organs. The parietal region is also important to the perception of pain, and other parts of the parietal lobes are involved in some aspects of short-term memory. Brain scan studies suggest that parietal lobes are also activated during the retrieval of contextual associations of memory. The temporal lobes are, are so-called because they lie uh, beneath the temples, and they are known to be particularly concerned with memory. Temporal lobe lesions are often associated with severe amnesia. Angleton in 2008 in, uh, concludes that there is now extensive evidence linking the temporal lobes to the encoding and the retrieval of memories of past events. The temporal lobes include the main auditory region of the cortex and a language center known as Wernicke's area, again usually in the left hemisphere, which is particularly concerned with memory for language and the understanding of speech. And this is according to Wernicke in 1878. Now you may wonder, why in all these foreign names? My goodness, Wernicke. Wernicke was a German. And remember, at this time, the Europeans were looking at uh, at the functions of, of the brain. They were trying to determine functions. Uh, in the United States, we were just trying to get people to, uh, to work faster, to work harder. Uh, so we were, we were behaviorists. Uh, they were functionalists. They were called functionalists. Um, another, another example is Broca. Broca is actually a French, was a Frenchman, but he was a Frenchman uh, whose uh, relatives were from Belgium, uh, so he had kind of a German name. Uh, I'll be right back. I have to go get my phone. Hello? Nope, I'm good. Okay. Sure, sure, yeah, that'd be great. Okay, okay, bye. Sorry, that was my wife. <laughs> she said a meeting. She wanted to tell me she it was over. Anyway, okay. So there's the reason. There's a the reason we have all these uh, interesting names: Wernicke and Broca. Broca is French, and Wernicke is German. But they were the ones uh, looking at the functions of, of the brain. They were trying to figure out why the brain was working. Uh, or how it works, and that's why we have Wernicke's area and Broca's area. Milner in 1966 reported that the temporal lobe, uh, amnestic patient HM, 
was unable to remember any information for long periods, but his ability to retain information for a few seconds was found to be completely normal. From these observations, it was concluded that HM's lesions had impaired his ability to store items in his long-term memory, but had caused no apparent impairment of his short-term memory. This finding suggests a dissociation between the short-term memory and long-term memory. In other words, they are separate systems. And this is really important. Now, this is what HM's uh, brain looked like. It, it, he had damage to his temporal lobe, and that caused uh, uh, long-term memory problems, but no short-term memory problems. So obviously, the short-term memory doesn't take place in the temporal lobes, but the long-term memory does. You can see the, uh, the lesions here. They actually took out his hippocampus. An interesting observation was made in a later study by Warrington and Shalise in 1969, whose patient KF suffered an impairment of short-term memory, but with an intact long-term memory. This is an exact reversal of the pattern of impairment found in, in uh, HM. It has, been, uh, it has thus been shown that either short-term memory or long-term memory can be separately impaired while the other remains intact. This is known as a double dissociation, and it provides particularly convincing evidence for a, a view that short-term memory and long-term memory involve separate memory systems, uh, and they take place in different portions of the brain. Uh, long-term memory in the temporal lobe uh, Short-term memory, it looks like, is in the parietal lobe because this is where KF's damage was done, right there. Why did KF have memory problems? Uh, KF was uh, uh, riding a motorcycle without a helmet. This is in 1969, and he did uh, extensive damage uh, to the... Uh, 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 uh. Let me explain something to you. If you ride on a motorcycle, your head's really heavy. And your neck's not as strong as it needs to be. Uh, not unless you lift weights and do you know, football exercises where you strengthen your neck. Most people don't have a very strong neck. And that includes most motorcycle riders. So if you're in an accident and you fall off the back of your motorcycle, uh, what happens is your head hyperextends backwards. And that's how he hit this portion of his head. Here's my arrow. I lost my arrow. There it is. That's how he hit this portion of his head. Uh, when he fell off the back of his bike, his head hyperextended backwards, and that's where the blow was, right there between the occipital lobe and the parietal lobe. If it had hit farther down, if he had been able to control his the, the weight of his head, uh, it probably he probably would have gone blind because it would have damaged his occipital lobe. But because he hit here, he uh, had short-term memory problems. And there's where the damage was. In order to operate as an information processing system, the brain must obviously have some way of representing information uh, for both processing and storage purposes. Information must be encoded in some representational or symbolic form which may bear no direct resemblance to the material being encoded. This is one of the reasons why we can't remember anything uh, from when we were babies. We can't remember being born. We can't remember our first birthday party. Uh, we can't, the only way that we can remember things is if we see pictures. Because when we're one year old, we don't have any representational or symbolic form to remember. We can't remember faces. Uh, we don't, haven't started talking yet, so we can't remember words. This is, and this is one of the reasons why we can't remember these things. So if uh, you can't remember anything earlier than your third birthday, you don't feel bad. I mean, that most people can't remember anything before their third birthday because they don't have any way of storing that information. They don't have any words. They don't have any pictures. Uh, you know, all, none of these things are important to them. And it's one of the reasons why when children are, are traumatized, 18-month-old uh, or 2-year-olds uh, are traumatized, that they have no memory of it, which is a good thing. In, in, those case, in that case, it's a good thing. 
The entire nervous system, including the brain, is composed of millions of neurons, which can activate one another by transmitting chemical substances called neurotransmitters across the gap separating them, which is known as the synapse. And that's what's happening here. There we go. There's the synapse right there. And that those are the chemicals being, being dropped out of the... Uh, there being dropped out and it's being picked up by these receptors dropped into the synapse from the axon. Cognitive processes are dependent on the ability of one neuron to activate another. Hebb's theory postulated that uh, if one adjacent, did I skip something? I haven't talked about Donald Hebb. Anyway, Hebb's theory postulated that if, if two adjacent neurons happen to fire simultaneously, then the connection between them will be strengthened. Thus, a synapse, which has been frequently uh, crossed in the past, will be more easily uh, crossed uh, by future signals. It is as though a path is being worn through the nervous system. And these are known as uh, Hebbian uh, uh, neurons. Uh, so this was the Hebbian theory. And Hebb made, uh, came up with this theory long before we were able to prove any of this. And then we, of course, uh, eventually we proved that Hebb was correct. Donald Hebb, H-E-B-B. Hebb suggested that the mechanism of synaptic strengthening would make it possible to build up a network of interconnected neurons, which could represent a particular pattern of input, a cell assembly. Uh, cell assembly is a group of cells which have become linked to one another to form a single functional network. Hebb proposed this structure as a possible biological mechanism underlying the representation and storage of memory traces. Okay, so what we have here is practice. Uh, if you see a piece of information, you remember it. Now, once upon a time, there was a... Uh, oh, once upon a time. There's a uh, poem called uh, The Hunting of the Snark. And in The Hunting of the Snark, uh, the individual tells you, what I tell you three times is true. In other words, if I repeat something three times, it's going to become true. So anything that I say three times, and this is, of course, advertising does this all the time. If they tell you something three times, you're going to remember it. And the reality is that three seems to be the magic number. Practice, if you practice something three times, it, uh, uh, it, it will stick with you. If you read your textbook three times, then you'll remember it. Um, but I know you're going, not going to read your textbook three times. <laughs> and this is one of the reasons why I do the lectures. Uh, if you read your textbook and then you listen to the lectures, you're getting the same piece of information at least twice. Now, how in the world am I going to make you remember this? You've read it. You've heard me say it. Now, how in the world am I going to? What's the third time that I'm going to force you uh, to be to force this thing into your long-term memory? And the answer is testing. Uh, I do not test uh, to find out what you know. I test to tell you what I think you should know. I'm not really testing. I'm not really trying to find out if you've memorized anything. That's not necessary. I just want you to know it. Uh, some people can cram for an exam and get A's every time. And then they forget it. That's not what I want you to do. I want you to remember this stuff. Uh, so if, I, if, if you listen to my lectures and you hear what I have to say, all the things that I think are important, and then I test you on it, that's at least twice. If you've read it, then, then the probability of it sticking with you is even greater. I'm trying to give you information. That's what I'm trying to do. So when I say memory trace and cell assembly, I'm talking about a pathway through the brain. I will probably ask you this question on the on the, the test. I think there's 20 questions, 20 questions in every chapter. So I'm not really trying. I'm, I'm not really trying to test you. I'm not really trying to find out if it's, it's in your brain. I don't care if you look it up. That's fine. Hey, look, you've you you've seen it twice, <laughs> and that's good. That's good. Okay. So that's, that's the way I teach. I apologize. It's not the traditional way of, of, uh, of setting you down and 
making sure that you don't uh, cheat on anything. It's not cheating. That's not why I'm testing you. I don't care about about you looking it up in your book. I want you to look it up in your book. I want you to get the answer correct because I want you to remember this. And that way you learn. Okay? All right? So I just told you a secret that uh, if the education department finds out, they'll fire me in a nanosecond. <clears throat> Hebb argued that a cell assembly could uh, come to represent a particular stimulus, such as an object or a face. If the stimulus had uh, caused this particular group of neurons to fire simultaneously, then the neurons would become connected to one another more and more strongly with repeated exposure to the stimulus. The more often you do it, the more often you see it, the more likely that you'll remember it. Ha! Ah, that's why I'm presenting the material the way I do. I want you to remember this stuff. When you go off to uh, get your master's degree or whatever, um, I, I want you to have this, this kind of information in your brain. You don't have to, to repeat it every day, but you, it needs to be in there someplace because, you know, this is cognitive psychology. And all of this stuff makes a lot of sense. Pathways through the brain. How do you remember something? How do you remember somebody's face? Interesting. I was at the uh, gym yesterday. I looked at weights yesterday, and when I was uh, getting dressed to uh, to come home, my dentist came in, uh, and and he was he was uh, uh, dressing right across from me, and he didn't recognize me. Why didn't he recognize me? He's seen my face a dozen times. He called. He's called me by name a dozen times. He didn't recognize me, and at first I didn't recognize him. Why? Because he was out of context. He was not my dentist. He was just a guy coming into the gym. If I, when I saw him, when I see him at the dentist's office, I know who he is. But it took me a couple shakes before I realized that he's my dentist. And he never did recognize me. And I started talking to him. He heard my voice, same voice I use when I'm at the dentist's office. But he never recognized me. And he was kind of offended that I was actually talking to him when I didn't know who he was, when theoretically I didn't know who he was. Really kind of interesting, isn't it? So we re recognize things by context. So there's other pieces of information that allow us to identify things. It's kind of fascinating. And that's part of cognitive psychology, too. It's part of psychology. It's part of social psychology. Context. Anyway, there we go. We're creating these cell assemblies in our brain. And if you see somebody out of context, then there's a piece of information that's missing. And potentially you can't identify them. Hebb's theory can explain the difference between short-term and long-term memory. Hebb speculated that the temporary activation of, of a cell assembly may active uh, by active neural firing could be the mechanism underlying short-term memory which is known, as, uh, known to be fragile and short-lived. However, after repeated firing, the synaptic connections between the neurons in a cell assembly undergo permanent changes, which are the basis of long-term memory storage. So it needs to be repeated. It needs to be put into your brain. A connection needs to be made. That pathway needs to be cut through your, uh, through, through your neurons. When Donald Hebb first proposed his theory in 1949, it was still largely spe speculative. However, long-term potentiation was discovered by Bliss and Lomo in 1973. Long-term potentiation is a lasting change in synaptic resistance following the application of electrical stimulation to living brain tissue. This is possibly one of the biological mechanisms underlying the learning process. Okay, this is what happens normally. So you see somebody, and this is uh, this is all the receptors and the uh, neurotransmitters that are passing between the uh, the two neurons. However, at, if after you've seen them and you've created other contexts and other pieces of information are coming in, uh, the next time you see them. Uh, we've got more stimulation going on because we have more pieces of information. And look at all the, uh, the increased receptor sites. 
That's long-term potentiation. That's what we're talking about. Now, when Donald Hebb first talked about this, we didn't know anything about neurotransmitters. We didn't know any. We knew something about neurons, but we really didn't have any specific information about neurons when he first came up with this idea. And then in 1973, Bliss and Lomo, they discovered long-term potentiation. And now Donald Hebb's starting to make a lot more sense. Short-term storage involves the strengthening of pre-existing synaptic connections, whereas long-term storage involves the growth of new synaptic connections between the neurons. This is according to Bailey and Kendall in 2004. Now you're saying, 2004, that was, that was almost 20 years ago. Yeah, that was almost 20 years ago, but I started studying psychology in 1975. So to me, 2004, that's only, tw that's only 20 years ago. I've been studying psychology for 50 years, haven't I? Uh, almost, 45 years. <laughs> I've been studying it a lot longer. We didn't have this, piece, this information. We couldn't see this kind of stuff. So we didn't know it. So all this is, is really kind of exciting. And this is one of the reasons why, if you have a college professor who's been teaching out of the same textbook for 20 years, potentially he's not giving you all the new information. He's just giving you all the old information. Because he got his PhD 25 years ago. And if he's not keeping current on what's going on, then potentially he's not giving you all the information you need. Okay, so let's say that uh, you see a new person. You see a new person, you never met this person before. And so this is what it looks like when you first see them. Okay, you've got two connectors here. Uh, okay, so, but then seconds later, after you've, you're looking at their face and you start talking to them, all of a sudden, other connection, connections are starting to be made. And after several minutes, after being around this individual, all of a sudden, we've got a new... This is a, a, a neuron bud has started being created because now this is somebody that we will permanently know. And now, of course, the uh, both sections of the uh, of the dendrite, the, the new dendrite has has more connectors. I hope all that makes sense. This is what happens to you when you're trying to learn to shoot a jump shot, or to make a, some kind of a fabulous layup. The first time you try it, uh, you, you kind of run through it or walk through it, and you kind of get it done. But if you do it a second time, you know, seconds later, you do it over and over again. This is why your coaches are doing this to you. This is why they're torturing you like this. Uh, you, you run through it a second time, your more connections are being made. As soon as you have run through it two and three and four times, now those connections are becoming permanent. And so in a game, it will come automatically. You won't have to think about it because all of these connections are there. And that's known as muscle memory. Schneider and Schifrin in 1977 discovered that some of the activities of the brain are under our conscious control, but many take place automatically and without our conscious awareness or intervention, like me shifting gears. No problem with my right hand, oh, but when I started shifting gears with my left hand, even though they were the same gears, different hand, my golly, I had to think about it. Uh, there, I, had, I needed controlled cognitive processes in order to shift those gears. Normally when I shift gears uh, in my, in my uh, Miata, uh, don't have to think about it. It's just automatic. Uh, you know, my my foot hits the clutch, pushes in on the clutch, and I shift gears, and then I release the clutch slowly. Uh, if I'm all by myself, I might pop the clutch. <laughs> That's the way you do it in a race car. But if I'm with my wife, I try to shift gears a little bit uh, slower so it doesn't jerk her, her head back and forth. I don't want her to have whiplash. Researchers made a distinction between controlled cognitive processes, which are carried out consciously and intentionally, 
and automatic cognitive processes which are not under conscious control. They suggested that because control processes require conscious attention, they are subject to limitations in processing capacity, whereas automatic processes do not require conscious attention and are not subject to such processing limits. Automatic processing will take place far more rapidly than controlled processing and will be relatively unaffected by distractions from other tasks which take up attention. And of course, this is what happens when I started driving uh, my, uh, my new car. It wasn't a new car, my old car in Japan. Uh, I needed to really think about it. Now, the other problem in Japan is that their roads are are narrow. They're really, really narrow. You can barely get two cars on the road at the same time. And on the side isn't, isn't a ditch. It's what they call binjo ditches. In other words, they're cement sewers. And if you run off the road, you run into this ditch and you can't get your wheel out. It's, it's about, I don't know, five or six inches, uh, uh, you know, more than that, like a half a foot deep. That's six inches, uh, eight or nine inches deep. Uh, so your wheel, if your wheel falls into that, that uh, binjo ditch, then uh, you can't get your car out. So you can't run off the road or you have to get a tow truck to pull you out of the ditch, the binjo ditch. Both controlled and automatic processing. Uh, let me explain to you why this is. In the United States, we have a lot of room. The United States is huge. Uh, when we build our roads, we build uh, a lot of extra extra. Uh, we have all this uh, extra land that we can run off into if we have to. In Japan, it's really crowded. And so where people are, um, they the roads are a certain width. And right next to them are not just the sidewalks. You have the binjo ditches, and then you have the sidewalks. And the binjo ditches are for drainage of one type or another. Anyway, it's it's so crowded in Japan that they can't. They don't have ditches like we have in the United States to run off on if, or to run out to. I mean, if you if your car breaks down, you're, you're blocking the lane because you can't pull off the road uh, in Japan. It's really kind of interesting. And Americans buy all these junky cars and then they, they break down and they're sitting in the middle of the road blocking traffic. Both controlled and automatic processing have their advantages. And when we are trying to solve a problem, we may need to choose between the different benefits of fast and slow thinking. Slow thinking is, is conscious thinking. Uh, fast thinking is automatic thinking. And this is one of the reasons why someone with more expertise, someone who's been doing a job for a long period of time, uh, they do things very rapidly. And every, everything is more automatic because they don't have to think about it. They don't have to concentrate. What's the best solution for this problem? And of course, uh, the, the faster solution is the automatic thinking. But automatic thinking does have a problem as well because uh, it's, it's fairly um, uh, rigid is the word I'm looking for. It's fairly rigid. The fast automatic processes allow us to carry out routine tasks rapidly and without using up our limited attentional capacity. However, automatic processes are rigid and inflexible. And when they fail to provide appropriate behavior, they may need to be overridden by slow thinking, which offers the flexibility of consciously controlled processing. We all have conscious awareness, but we do not really know what it is. We can all understand what is meant by term, the term consciousness as a subjective experience, but no one has yet been able to provide a satisfactory explanation of what conscious awareness actually is or how it might arise from the neural activity. Consciousness is often described as an emergent property of the brain, which mean, means that it is a phenomenon that emerges as a result of the organization of a very complex system such as the, uh, the cortex. Now, you're, it looks like this dolphin grabs that bird out of the air, but the reality is, oh, there's the bird right there. Okay, the bird is right here. Okay, he doesn't. He's nowhere close to the bird. He's not really jumping. He's just jumping up. I think he's in a, he's following a boat. He's not really trying to catch the gull. He probably couldn't catch it anyway. I just wanted to tell you that, because when I first saw it, I thought he was snatching the bird out of the air, but he doesn't do that. 
Consciousness remains the last unexplored frontier of psychology. Some patients with visual agnosia, impaired perception, can detect visual stimuli at an unconscious level, but have no conscious awareness of seeing them. This phenomenon is known as blind sight. We're going to talk about blind sight in later chapters. Uh, so all of these things that I've talked about, we're going to cover all this stuff. It has also been found that many amnestic patients make responses which reveal evidence of previous learning of which they have no conscious recollection. Mandler in 1989 uh, has argued that the memory trace must still be in storage, but the amnestic patient has lost the ability to bring it into consciousness. In other words, it's still in there. It's in their brain someplace. They're, they just can't find the, the, uh, the, the cue to use to bring that, that memory back forward. Autism is another disorder which has shed some light on the nature of consciousness because autistic individuals appear to lack some of the usual characteristics of conscious processing. Their behavior tends to be highly inflexible and repetitious, and they often lack the ability to develop a normal rapport with other people. Baron Cohen in 1992 suggests uh, that autistic people may lack a theory of mind, meaning that they are unable to understand the existence of mental processes in others. Baron Cohen argues that conscious uh, awareness uh, enables us to understand other people's thoughts and feelings which is an essential requirement for normal social interaction. Okay, one of the things I need to tell you now, yeah, why did they say autism instead of autism spectrum disorder? Uh, this textbook comes uh, from England. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've corrected all of the English spelling. The English don't spell things the way we do. Uh, so I have corrected all that in my... In, uh, in my book or in my PowerPoints, uh, if while you're reading through the books, if they use an extra U someplace, or instead of saying C E N T R E R, they say C E N T R E. Uh, yeah, that's okay in England, but not in the United States. Probably, if um, this, this this were edited for the United States, this book were edited for the United States, it would say autism spectrum disorder. But the British, the Brits don't do that, uh, so there you go. Uh, I didn't realize when I got the book, um, I had a really busy summer, uh, so I wasn't able to um, uh, look through the book uh, before I ordered it. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, it, it is an English book. Does that mean that uh, it's different? Uh, the answer is no, except for the spelling and some of the terms that they use. Um, their sentence structure is, is a little bit different. Uh, I'll try to correct that before it occur or when I go through the uh, when I go through my PowerPoints. I'll try to correct all that so that you don't get confused with their syntax and, and U.S. syntax and English syntax. Um, but I, you know, I didn't I didn't realize what I was doing. The other thing that <laughs> the other thing that happened to me and, and this kind of messed me up. Uh, was the fact that it's English. The, the English don't uh, uh, create supplemental uh, material for the instructor, uh, whereas they do in the United States. So here I'm stuck with just a textbook, and I have to come up with my own lectures. I know, don't cry. Uh, you, you thought I was doing that anyway. But what normally happens is, uh, it, it, with an, a, a U.S. text, um, they will give you supplemental material, and part of that supplemental material uh, are um, PowerPoints. Uh, the PowerPoints are usually fairly uh, skeletal. Uh, there's not a whole lot of information in there, uh, but it, it at least gives you a framework to, to build your, um, your lecture on. And, and uh, this is an, since this is an English book, I've got to create my own skeleton as well as my own lecture. So uh, if I, if I uh, fumble around a little bit, or it takes me a little bit longer to put these PowerPoints together. It's because I'm creating them all pretty much out of whole cloth. So I have to read the text and then, you know, create the, decide what's what's good and what's bad and whatnot. Uh, so this textbook comes, this is uh, Introduction to Cognitive Psychology by Arnfeldt and, no, that's not right. Who is, oh, Groom. This is by Groom. 
And it's got a bunch of authors, uh, editors. Uh, Groom is the main editor. Uh, each chapter is written by somebody else. So that should be interesting. Uh, I am cutting and pasting uh, some of the uh, some of it, uh, so don't think that that all of this is is me. Uh, it is uh, it's pretty much uh, out of the book. Uh, so we'll see how this goes. Uh, this is the first time we've ever taught this class. Like I said before, uh, the class was uh, proposed by a um, a former colleague who's not here anymore. Well, if this class it doesn't make any sense to you. Uh, we may decide to just uh, drop it. Uh, but this is good information. Uh, so far, I mean, everything that I've told you so far uh, makes a lot of sense, and this is something that we need to look at. Uh, the cognitive way of saying this is all. You know, cognitive psychology uh, likes to say this is always the way something is. They are absolutist about some of these things, and you know some of their theories. And I don't like to say anything's absolute, so I won't say that to you, even though the book may say that. I'm not going to say that to you. All right. Uh, one interesting finding from an electroencephalogram, an EEG study by Libet in 1985, is that when we make a conscious decision to act in some way, the conscious awareness of the decision appears to follow the actual decision rather than preceding it. Support for this finding comes from functional MRI studies uh, soon at all in 2008. In view of this discovery, Wegner in 2003 has suggested that decisions may actually be made at an unconscious level and conscious awareness of the decision only follows later when we observe its outcomes. I have a different explanation for this. But see, this is something that, this is what really irritates me about cognitive psychology. They say, because this happened and this happened and this happened, it must be this. Uh, but there are other explanations for this. Uh, so why in the world does it look like your decision, um, you make the decision before your brain uh, starts firing off rapidly? Um, I would say that it probably has to do with you make a decision and then you start making plans for that decision because of that decision. You know, everything, it's like a cascade of thought. Uh, so you say, eh, I think I'll go to... Uh, I think I'll go to Gallup, and then all of a sudden you're saying, I need to go to Walmart, I need to go to, to uh, Home Depot, I need to get a hamburger. All of that, all that, uh, that, that increases your, uh, your, your decision making. So let's not even worry about Wegener, uh, Libet, and, uh, and Soon. I put this in here because this is the way uh, that, that uh, research is done a lot. Uh, especially by the cognitive psychologists. I have a different explanation. They may be absolutely correct. These guys may be absolutely correct. You know, I'm just a, I'm just a different thinker, I guess. Neuroimaging studies have shown that conscious awareness tends to be mainly associated with activation of the prefrontal cortex and the superior parietal cortex. It has been argued that conscious awareness is not restricted to one specific region of the brain, as it possibly depends on the integration of a number of inputs from different brain areas, especially when they are activated simultaneously. And that's according to Dehane and Nakachi. And that's the end of, of, the, uh, of the chapter. Um, chapter I, I haven't looked at really, I haven't really looked at chapter two yet. Next week, we'll tackle something else. Uh, I'll try not to be as negative about, uh, about some of this information. Uh, but I will probably tell you when I think something is, is possibly inaccurate. Maybe they're over-reading things like they did with conscious thought. Uh, anyway, so uh, have fun. This is uh, one of the things that I need to explain to you is that cognitive psychology is very research oriented. And this is one of the reasons why I'm going to have you look at, uh, at recent research. As we see, you know, maybe this book was written in the, in the 2000s uh, because there's not a whole lot of references that are after 2010. Um, and, and for this reason, there may be new information out there that's, that's better, that's new, that's, that's uh, actually gives us different information. So, yeah, I will ask you to give me a, uh, 
an article critique about something that deals with uh, one of the keywords in the chapter. And you can see the keywords at the end of the chapter, I believe, uh, or they're the highlighted words. Uh, you know, look up, um, I don't know, how did we just look at something highlighted? Blind sight. You can look up blind sight, or you can look up uh, yeah, cell assembly. Uh, or you know, new research on cell assembly, or long-term and short-term memory. You know, there's just lots of that stuff that you can look at in this chapter. Cerebral cortex. Yeah, you can identify the brains or the lobes of the brain or whatever. Or information overload. This is a great picture. Huh? Uh, or you can look up Heb. I think he's still alive. I'm pretty sure he's still alive. Bottom-up processing. Well, maybe he's not. I was born in 1949, and I'm 72 years old. So if he's come up with his theory in 1949, he's probably in his 20s someplace. Uh, that would that would make him uh, in his 90s. So maybe Heb's gone. Uh, but yeah, there's lots of stuff to look up. Gestaltus. You can look up some of the old guys. Anyway, there we go. Computer modeling. Uh, Okay, so I every place I've been, I've had a cognitive. I've worked with a cognitive psychologist. Um, sometimes it's difficult to uh, to, to talk to them because they're absolutists. Uh, they think that uh, well, research is pointing in this direction, therefore this must be true. Well, sometimes research is wrong, uh, or sometimes they didn't use enough subjects. You know, and that's one of the reasons why I want you to do the. Uh, article critiques should be fun uh let's all let's all yell at these people and i'll see you next week